Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Downshire. Happy Easter. Um, we will start this beautifully joyful morning with a proclamation um, shared by Christians across this land. So if you're able, and only if you're able, because there's going to be a bit of standing and sitting at the start of the service, if you're able, please stand. I will say Christ is written, Christ is risen, and his people will reply, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. Let's go again. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. Once more. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. Thank you. Sit, if you would like to sit down again. The choir will now come and continue our time of worship by singing, Oh, What a Morning. They take their seats, they're probably going to want to stay standing because we're now going to join in a congregational song, Thine Be the Glory.
So my name's Christine. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an elder, so that just means I'm part of the leadership team here um, at Downshire. Um, our minister, Nathan, is on paternity leave, and he'll be on leave until Thursday, the 4th of April. Um, if you need the service of a minister, um, please speak to your elder, or if you don't know who your elder is, um, contact me, and my number, if you don't have it, is on the back of a monthly notice sheet, which is in the entranceway there, on the left-hand side as you're leaving. Um, I also have a message from Gail, who is our um, social committee convener, to say a really big thank you to everyone who helped make the soup and sweet a great time together. Um, thank you to all who have contributed food, served, helped to set up, to tidy up, and of course everyone who stayed to enjoy the food and fellowship. Thank you so much. It was a lovely time. On that note though, Tea and Coffee Rotor is still looking awful sparse. Um, if you are able to help at all, if you're able to serve and allow somebody else to set it up for you, that's great. Um, do have a look and see if there's a, a Sunday in April that you might be able to be part of a team. That would be fantastic. <coughs> We're going to have a time of prayer now just to pray over our children just before they go out to their groups. Lord, we thank you on this Easter Sunday morning for noise and happiness, and maybe the children would even say chocolate eggs. Lord, we thank you for all your good gifts to us. Lord, as the children go out to their groups, we pray that you would be with them and with their leaders and help us. Allow them a blessed time of knowing your presence with them and learning more about you. Amen. So kids can go out to Platform Kids, or there's creche in the room just behind here in the Clements room.
Let us pray. God, our Father, on this glorious Easter day, we come together to offer praise and adoration for Jesus. Jesus risen, alive, powerful and victorious, the salvation of the world. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Lord, without the resurrection of your Son, our faith would be empty and without hope. But he is alive, and we rejoice in the knowledge that in Jesus all that separates, injures, and destroys has been overcome by that which unites and heals and creates. We pray for your church here at Downshire and all the churches in the town, and we give thanks for calling us into the company of those who trust in Christ and seek to obey his will. We think of your church worldwide as your, as your people celebrate individually in small groups and in congregations, large and small, as they gather to bring praise and worship to you. Our language, race, and nationalities may be different, but our worship is one, and our praise for you united. Lord God, we pray for those Christians who are persecuted for their faith and who are unable to loudly proclaim Alleluia in celebration of the risen King. May our own Alleluia speak boldly into a world that can seem filled with darkness and sorrow for so many, knowing that through Jesus Christ, the hurts of this world hold no power in the eternal kingdom. We remember today those countries involved in wars and conflicts. We pray for those who long for peace, for freedom from oppression, and for justice. We pray that the good news of the resurrection, new life and salvation, will reach into even the darkest places of suffering. Lord, on this special day, grant us peace in your world for countries where, where there is war and communities that are broken. We pray for all who seek to bring peace to a troubled world and for all service personnel on active duty. And we ask that you will keep them safe until they return home to their families and those they love. We pray now for those who need your resurrection power and hope in their lives today. Those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Those struggling with poor physical and mental health. Those facing personal battles with addictions. Those trapped in poverty and systems of injustice. May they know your presence, receive your hope, and be touched by your joy. On this Easter day, hear now our own silent prayers as we remember before you family and friends and those nearest and dearest to us, confident that you care and you will hear the earnest prayers of every heart. Faithful God, as we go out into the world, we pray that we may reflect your love in our families, our church, and our community, so that the world can see that we are followers of Christ and draw others into your loving care. We pray that the Holy Spirit may guide and strengthen us in mission and service, praying that day by day we may grow in love for you and for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
So those of you who were here a couple of weeks ago uh, may remember that Adam said he would be preaching today. Um, that's Adam Cree. Um, but unfortunately, he's unwell, and he, but we do have a sermon that he has written that I'm going to share with you now. So we're going to start by reading Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 41. So that's Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 41. God's word says the following. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said this about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, you will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew what God had promised him on oath, that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life. We are all witnesses to it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So, The context behind this passage is fairly straightforward, but hugely significant. The crowds of people currently in Jerusalem are all there for the celebration of Pentecost, the annual Jewish feast of of the giving of the law, or the Torah. And to the Jews at that time, it would have been called Shavuot. The people tuning into Peter's message, unsurprisingly, would have been Jewish. And that means a huge amount for us as we read this sermon, as the language and message Peter shares contains many references to Jewish scripture and prophecy, as well as words that we use today, but the words that wouldn't have had the same weight for non-Jews at that time. So this message is specifically for the Jews who had come to celebrate Shabbat, the giving of the law. This is important information as we read. You see, The Jews would have been well rehearsed in their laws, prophecies, and history. Their culture was saturated with these things. Every millimeter of their lives was formed around the Torah, the Jewish scriptures. These words, this scripture, would have held even more weight as the Jewish crowds came to celebrate one of their major holidays. Even more again when we realize that this holiday, this feast, was in celebration of the giving of the Torah, the very law that kept them right with God. And again, God's timing couldn't be better for the disciples to minister to this crowd. Peter, having been Jewish himself and aware of this context, 
stands, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and shares to the gospel to those who are gathered here. And here is why Peter's sermon is the perfect message for us this Easter Sunday. You see, the first section from verses 22 and 23, he focuses briefly on the ministry of Jesus and then on to his death and resurrection. Supported by the Old Testament prophecy from Psalm 16, he outlines the foretelling of the resurrection and the promise of the pouring out of the Holy Holy Spirit as prophesied in Joel 2. So the Holy Spirit is at work through Peter, delivering this brilliantly articulated message formed around specific Jewish scripture and prophecy. Scripture and prophecy they would have known and be very familiar with and marrying this with the ministry of Jesus, who in Acts 2, verse 22, Peter claims this crowd already know and have heard of. And marrying these things together, about 3,000 were added to the number of believers that day. Though for the Jewish crowd, I believe there is one word that carries more weight than any within Peter's message. And for those listening, And us today, especially today, a word that is very important to us to understand. From verse 36, the account of Peter's conclusion tells us, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Lord and Messiah. Messiah to this Jewish crowd was a loaded word. It wasn't some throwaway word that you could just brandish around. It meant something. It had weight. Weight that without a Jewish background or good understanding can be hard for us to fathom today. For us to grasp the full weight of this word, Messiah, and what it meant to the Jews at the time, and for us, we would need to study the Old Testament back to front and somehow immerse ourselves in Jewish culture and custom that was present at that time. We maybe don't have time to do that this morning, Uh, but let me explain a little bit more. To the Jewish listener, especially on this day, considering the context of Pentecost, the idea of the Messiah brought forth all sorts of ideas, some of which we looked at last week in our Palm Sunday service, thinking about the expectations of the Jewish people. The Messiah conjured up ideas of ruler, conqueror, freedom from oppression, salvation, (coughs) but from the Roman occupiers. A godly ruler to bring restoration and salvation back to the Jewish nation. Messiah was perhaps an even more loaded word on this specific day. And Peter, as an ethnic Jew, was standing before this crowd and proclaiming Jesus is not just Lord, but in him, in his death and through his resurrection, he is our Messiah. And as Peter had just quoted from Joel 2, verse 28, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Saved. This is what the Messiah has done, saved us, but maybe not quite how the Jews expected. The word saved, sozo in the Greek, is an amazing word. It isn't a simple act. It means to make something whole or complete. This idea of the holistic person being delivered or protected. And this holistic approach is exactly what our Lord and Messiah Jesus did upon the cross and through his resurrection. (coughs) Summarized in Romans 6, verses 5 to 7. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. In his death, we were buried with him. He took the entirety of our brokenness, our sin, 
shame and guilt, all those parts of us that can't exist in the presence of God's holiness and supernaturally took it all. Your addictions, emotional scars, lies, cheating, those feelings and thoughts that you hope never get found out. Jesus took it all upon his shoulders. That is what held him there on that cross. Us, you and I, all of our brokenness. And if the story ended there, we might think, good. Someone might die for our mistakes, our pain. But the sealing of that promise was completed in the resurrection. Romans 6 goes on in verse 8 to say, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Even more, is it not that in Christ we are dead to our sin, but that in Christ we are alive in newness of life? We join with him in his resurrection. Just as much as you were on his mind during the crucifixion, you were in his heart upon his resurrection. And it was nothing you or I did or didn't do that fulfilled this work on our behalf. There is nothing we can do There is nothing we can add to or bring to our salvation. We can add nothing. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is the thing that sets our faith apart from any other. There is nothing you can add to salvation. Nothing. No good works, no deeds can kill off your brokenness. We can't save ourselves. We can't will away our own brokenness. We can't hope away our addictions or our mistakes. We can't cleanse ourselves of the sin that separates us from God. We're just too broken. And we all know this all too well. All the self-help books in the world, all the seminars, all the conferences, there's an entire industry targeting these things today, telling people we can pull ourselves together out of our own pit. As far as I've seen, the industry is very successful. If one book or seminar worked, I guess there wouldn't be an industry. No, only Jesus can do it, and only our faith in him can restore us to fullness, to relationship with the God that created us and loves us so much. This is what sets us apart. It's nothing to do with you and I. We can't do it. We can't live up to the perfect laws and statutes of God's holiness. It's just unattainable. Only in Jesus, only when we find ourselves dead to sin in the sacrifice of Jesus and alive to newness of life in the resurrection is it possible. As Christians, we know that the holiness in and of ourselves is impossible, but as Christians, we have the one who did it for us. This is our Messiah. This is the weight of the word that the Jewish crowd were cut to the heart with. What, that what no man could do God did for us. The holiness that we couldn't attain was gifted to us. Our Messiah took the bill with all the list of unholiness itemized against your name and signed it, paid in full. As Romans Romans 6 continues in verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord the free gift, eternal life, wholeness, eternal wholeness in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Messiah. What's our part? So naturally the people asked many, as many of us do when we come to Jesus. In Acts 2 verse 37, they said, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. What must we do? 
the question on many of our lips as we come to Jesus. I understand the free gift. I want it. What do I do? Well, it's quite simple. Repent. When John the Baptist preached, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus began to preach, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, when Peter began to preach, he started with repentance. Although there is nothing for us to add to the finished work of Christ, although we can do nothing to save ourselves, fix ourselves, or rid ourselves of our sinfulness, there is something asked of us to repent. Now, this word has often been misused and misunderstood for generations. Culturally, we have distorted this word, not always negatively, but we have often, often misplaced its true meaning. To repent does not mean to feel sorry, but it means to change one's mind or direction. The Greek word, the Greek word we translate as repent is metanoio. This same Greek word is taken in English for words like metamorphosis, the word for a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. Essentially, to repent is to make change, to think differently. And often in the New Testament, used in tandem with faith, we see it time and time again. Mark 1, verse 15, and saying, this time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Acts 20, 21, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 10, verse 9, because... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. They had thought a certain way about Jesus before, considering him worthy of crucifixion. Now they must turn their thinking round, embracing Jesus as Lord and Messiah. Repentance must never be thought of as something we must do before we can come back to God. Repentance describes what coming to God is. You can't turn towards God without turning from the things he is against. It is one and the same thing. Repentance is this changing of mind, that realization of the finished work of Jesus, the decision to pursue him. Not an act of saying, I've got it together, but a change of mind that says he the Lord has got it all together for me. I can trust in him. I may not be perfect, but I can trust the one who is, the one who did it for me, the one who can and will. In this sense, repent is a word of great hope. It says you don't have to continue the way you've been going. You can turn to God. The beauty of understanding the nature of real repentance is that it starts to cast a light on its importance in all our lives as believers. It's not a one-time thing. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 tells us, though your outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This renewing, repentance, change of mind is being done day by day as we trust Jesus, our Messiah, to work in and through us. Colossians 3, 9-10 illuminates this idea of repentance even more. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Renewal, change of mind, the desire to follow Jesus, the desire to pursue God's ways for your life, not once, but day by day being renewed. How? By your own efforts? No. By your striving and self-hatred? Absolutely not. True repentance comes from being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created us. Repentance day by day, this changing, this turning to God and growing in the knowledge of him is true repentance saying no to self-service, to our own will, 
and yes to the free, free gift of renewal that comes in the form of the resurrected Jesus, our Messiah, who again paid our debt in full, and as we trust in him, depend on him, he does the real work of renewal in and through us. As we make the decision to follow him, to trust him, and put our faith in Christ alone, this is true repentance. As we close, my prayer is that as we have journeyed this incredible Easter week, that we grasp the realities of his death and resurrection. But not as some far off and distant historical facts, but as our personal story with Jesus. That as we unpack the Easter events, we see the glory that Jesus has for us. We see the magnitude of his death and resurrection. Regardless of how long you've walked with Jesus, no matter how well rehearsed you are in the Easter narrative, there is more for you. Your Messiah has come. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in and through you. Continue. A second Corinthian tells us to allow Jesus to re renew you day by day. Through prayer and reading of God's word, seek true repentance, the kind that pulls you towards God and all the love, grace, and mercy in Jesus. And on the other hand, for those of you who are yet to know Jesus as your Messiah, as your Savior, my prayer for you is the same. I pray that the Spirit works through these fallible words that seeds are planted and that repentance isn't far, not in an old-fashioned street corner preaching type repentance, but that your heart would be softened to the truth to the love and grace of the gospel, that your repentance, your change of mind wouldn't be far off, that your change in direction, your change in desire to pursue all that Jesus has for you. Everything Easter means for you, forgiveness, wholeness, fullness of life in Christ, that is no longer you who needs to strive for perfection, but you realize Jesus did it for you. Your debt has been paid in full, your Messiah has come, and I pray your change of heart is not far off. Let me encourage you. It is finished, and it has been sealed. The work has been completed, and Jesus asks nothing of us but our repentance and our faith. Let us pray. Lord, we long to seek you more. We long to know you. Thank you that you are Messiah. Thank you that you have saved us. Thank you that on this Easter Sunday, our hope is in you. Amen. Invite the band up.
As we close our service, we say together the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.